Well, hi there. My name is David Kowalik from Godwit Ministries, and today we're going to do our second part in the series on glory, which is really building up towards looking at what the gospel is really all about. Now, I once heard of a fisherman being referred to as a brimless marlin catcher. Now, this is actually a disparaging term because brim are the most common and easy to catch fish on the east coast of Australia. And just about anyone who's dangled a line has caught plenty of them. Now, later, as you develop as a fisherman, as an angler, you go on to catch other fish such as, say, salmon or tailor. And later still, if you get even more advanced, you go on to more difficult species such as trout or tuna. Eventually, given enough time and money and skill, you might go on to catch the prize of the angling world, which of course is marlin. Now, in more recent times, people with a pile of money can easily afford to go on a game fishing charter and catch a marlin on the very first time they ever go fishing in their entire lives. So the problem with catching a marlin on your very first outing is that you are a brimless marlin catcher. That is, you haven't learned all the skills you need to learn, haven't developed as a person in order to catch the hardest to catch fish in the sea. You're relying entirely on someone else's experience and skill. And I believe that we 21st century Christians who've had 2000 years of tradition and theology handed to us, we could be brimless marlin catchers as well. We can easily miss the significance of things for which our predecessors bled and died. And I believe that the significance of Jesus as the Son of God is one of those things that's simply been handed to us. The truth of who Jesus is as the Son of God remains the most essential element of our faith, whether we acknowledge it or not. You might remember the story in Matthew 16 where Jesus asked his disciples who people were saying that he was. And they replied saying, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now to this, Jesus said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. You can read about that in Matthew 16, verses 13 through to 16. Now, if I were to loosely translate what Peter is saying here, it would look something like this. He'd be saying, I know who you are. You're the one we Jews have been waiting for all these years. The one who will fulfill all the promises made to Abraham. You're the Messiah, which for the Jews who lived 2000 years ago was equivalent to saying the son of God. Now, Jesus immediately realized the enormous transformation in Simon Peter's perception. And so he says to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. That's in Matthew 16, verse 17. But there's even more going on here. What Peter would have previously understood by the term son of God was very different from what he was now seeing in the person who stood in front of him. Peter, like any full-blooded Jew in his day, almost certainly had an image of the Messiah or the Son of God as a warrior king striding into town with unstoppable power. Armies of angels had his command, his sword of vengeance dark with the blood of the enemies of Israel, who would then establish the everlasting physical kingdom of God in the city of Jerusalem. But Jesus was completely redefining the meaning of Son of God. And Peter was beginning to see things through new eyes, to see what would have been impossible to see without God making it seeable. As Jesus put it elsewhere, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Matthew 11, verse 27. So then Jesus went on and explained to Peter that it would be on this otherwise inconceivable revelation that the church would ultimately be built and stand strong through the ages. And so wonderful would this revelation be that nothing and no one could stop it, not even death. See Matthew 16 verse 18. So as far as Jesus was concerned, the revelation of his true identity as the Son of God is at the very heart of the gospel. Now, before we go on, we need to appreciate what the term son of God meant because Jesus wasn't the only one referred to as the son of God. Political leaders 
and powerful angelic beings were also known as the sons of God. And even Adam himself was called a son of God. So the term son of God defines someone who has been invested with divine authority to rule. But the sonship of Jesus is different and unique. Jesus is not merely some kind of middle manager who's been invested with authority from God because Jesus himself actually is God. See, no one would have suspected that Jesus was, in fact, the divine son of God. He is, after all, a human being. But there's more to this man than meets the eye. Even the disciples were often puzzled by Jesus and left guessing to his true and real identity. You know, for instance, when Jesus calmed the wind and the waves with a single command, they were utterly astonished. And they asked each other, who is this man that he commands the wind and the waves? That's in Luke 8 verse 25. Or when the disciples heard Jesus pray, they were similarly amazed and said to Jesus, teach us to pray. That's in Luke 11 verse 1. It was as if they were saying, we want to pray like you do. They thought they were praying well enough until they heard Jesus praying. That was real prayer. And the first time they'd really heard someone praying to God as if he was someone who was truly known. Or there was that other time when Peter, who was a full-time professional fisherman, decided to humor Jesus after Jesus told him to put down his nets in the wrong place at the wrong time of day. Yet he ended up catching a huge haul of fish. That story is in Luke 5 verses 1 to 11. I believe that the thing that the disciples were seeing, which marked Jesus as unique among all other human beings, was simply the way that he carried himself in the world. He was always perfectly at ease with everyone and anyone that he met, no matter who they were. But even more amazing was the way that he spoke comfortably and directly to God and addressed him typically as Father. Now for a Jew in that day, to address as father in an intimate or familiar way was considered as a serious blasphemy. Indeed, on one occasion, after Jesus declared, I and the father are one, some of his hearers were intent on lynching him on the spot and they accused him of blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. That's in John 10 verses 30 to 32. And this was the real reason that the elders of Israel ultimately condemned Jesus to death. I mean, just have a look at Matthew 26 verses 64 to 67 to get a bit more background on that. Not that you could blame the Jews for thinking this way. I mean, who could have imagined that the all-powerful maker of heaven and earth would even consider being confined to the lowly status of being a human being? Now, the irony of all this caught everyone by surprise. It's certainly not the kind of glory that the Messiah watchers were waiting for. But as is often the case, the glory of God is revealed where it's most concealed. God becoming a human being what theologians call the incarnation, really is an incredible and an astonishing event. Yet 2,000 years on, we take it all for granted. The disciples of Jesus weren't taking these things for granted, that's for sure. For them, the incarnation was a world-changing reality. Finally, the lid had been lifted on who God really is and what the kingdom of God is really all about. And post-Pentecost, they came to fully realize the vital significance of who Jesus is and what that meant for the entire world. Now, of all the disciples, the Apostle John seems to have understood the implications more than any of them. He begins his account of the gospel by going right back to before creation. And he writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. That's John 1 verse 1. And this is the first word of the gospel right here. Indeed, it's actually the first word of the Bible because it precedes everything, even creation and even time. The word beginning there doesn't mean the beginning of time. It actually means the source of everything, like a fountain from which other things proceed. Even time proceeds out of the fountain, which is before time. Now, when John writes that the word was with God, he means far more than simply being in the same neighborhood. He is writing of an ongoing and face-to-face -face relationship. This means that before anything was created, God wasn't sitting around bored and lonely in an empty void. Far from it. 
love, joy, conversation, friendship and laughter preceded and always existed before anything was created. I mean, Jesus said as much when he prayed to the Father just before his crucifixion, and he said, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. That's John 17, verse 5. Now, I'd like to suggest that this withness is the connection and the life and the love that Jesus, as the Son, has always enjoyed in relationship with his Father. This is the glory he's talking about here. And it's the magnificence of this union that ultimately defines him as the Son. But here's the thing. This withness that Jesus has enjoyed for eternity with the Father has now been earthed and revealed in the Son of God as he becomes a human being. Now the glory of God, the essential character and nature of God, is on full and accessible display in the humanity of Jesus, who is Christ. As John has it a few verses later, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. That's John 1 verse 14. I find many people are confused by the idea of the Trinity on the concept of them being three in one. But it's got nothing to do with arithmetic. Rather, it's all about the utter oneness of heart and mind and purpose that's shared between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it's this oneness that Jesus embodies and which constitutes his glory. But what does John mean when he says that Jesus is the Word of God? To answer this question, it's necessary first to understand what the usage of the word actually means right here. What, after all, is a word? Well, a word is perhaps best understood as the gathered and arranged rationale of a certain body of knowledge which is then declared and transferred from one person to another. A word is a means of conveying a thought or an intention or the will of one from one to another. You know, for instance, the words you are hearing right now convey my thoughts to you to some degree at least. And through them, you're beginning to know me just a little through these words. But the problem with words like these is that they're indirect and secondhand. I mean, after all, you're watching this probably on an electronic device of some sort. If, on the other hand, I were to call you on a phone and engage you in conversation, then my spoken words would convey even more of myself to you. The tone of my voice, my accent, my emotions would all say something more about me. But best of all would be if I were to meet you face to face then my whole body and being would become a word. Apparently, I cannot verbally hide things from my wife. She knows me so well that no matter what I say, the real truth is all too evident in my body language. You know, the subtle nuances of my voice, the position of my eyebrows, the way I sit, they all conspire to send a word that reveals my innermost thoughts. And this is precisely what John means when he writes, the word became flesh, and made his dwelling amongst us. John 1 verse 14. What a remarkable statement. Jesus is more than a messenger. He, in fact, is the message. He's not merely the teller of a word from God. He is God. All other human words, religious, philosophical, and cultural, are eclipsed by the word which we find in Jesus. For the word we see in Jesus is a revelation of the ultimate truth, it's a revelation of the inner being and nature of God. And in him, we see God fully glorified. So this means that Jesus didn't just come to dwell amongst us merely to deliver a message to us. His dwelling amongst us is actually what it's all about. His dwelling is the message. So you see, just as the Son has always dwelled with the Father, now he has come to share the nature and the magnificence of their mutual dwelling with one another with us, so that we might ultimately become the children of God. That's in John 1 verse 12. This is another way of saying that we will ultimately come to dwell with God and know the very same withness that Jesus has always known and experienced and enjoyed with the Father. God didn't reveal his glory in the incarnation just so that we might admire it. His intention was for us to participate in it. God wanted to share his glory around. Yet most often when I hear preaching about the incarnation, if at all, it's nearly always about how Jesus came to dwell amongst us so that he could redeem us. Now, while I do believe this notion is perfectly sound and true, 
we must also go on to say that God redeems us for himself so that we can dwell with him. I mean, after all, atonement is really all about at one It's bringing us together. Yet somewhere along the road of Christian history, we seem to have largely forgotten this vital truth. You know, I once dropped into my local Christian bookstore specifically to purchase a two-part commentary on the Epistle to the Romans. And I was amazed to discover that there were over a dozen copies of the second volume gathering dust on the shelves while the first volume was sold out. Now, I didn't understand why this was so at first, but then it dawned on me. The first half of the Epistle to the Romans is all about the means and the process of salvation while the second is mostly about the ultimate purpose that salvation serves, which is the glorification of creation, the restoration of Israel, and the conclusion of the covenants, and so on. But it seems to me that ever since the Reformation, despite its necessary and remedial effect, we've become so fixated with getting saved that we've overlooked the end goal that salvation serves, that we would come to know the God that Jesus knows as Father, so that we too would know him as Father and therefore be ready to take our place in the restoration of creation as truly redeemed sons of God. Now that's something we're going to explore sometime in the near future. But for now, let's just say this. The incarnation was vital for salvation, granted. But that wasn't the only reason that Jesus came in the flesh. Jesus came to share the glory of his oneness with the Father with us. The Apostle Paul states it very clearly and plainly in his second epistle to the Thessalonians. And this is a verse which almost no one has underlined in their Bibles. But have a listen to these words. And I quote, God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. But can you see what's going on there? Salvation isn't the end of the plan. The plan is that through salvation, you would share in the glory of Christ. Only Jesus is capable of doing this because he alone is the unique Son of the Father, and he shares that with us. And that's got to be good news. Thanks for watching and don't forget to go to our website and you can also like and share this video and help get this out to as many people as possible. Thanks for watching.